This is a reading of The Ecology of Freedom, The Emergence and Dissolution of Hierarchy by Murray Bookchin. And now we're continuing by reading chapter one, the concept of social ecology. The legends of the Norsemen tell of a time when all beings were apportioned their worldly domains. The gods occupied a celestial domain, Asgard, and men lived on Earth, Midgard, below which lay Niflheim, the dark, icy domain of the giants, dwarves, and the dead. These domains were linked together by an enormous ash, the world tree. Its lofty branches reached into the sky and its roots into the furthermost depths of the earth. Although the world tree was constantly being gnawed by animals, it remained evergreen, renewed by a magic fountain that infused it continually with life. The gods, who had fashioned this world, presided over a precarious state of tranquility. They had banished their enemies, the giants, to the land of ice. Fenris, the wolf, was enchained, and the great serpent of the Midgard was held at bay. Despite the lurking dangers, a general peace prevailed, and plenty existed for the gods, men, and all living things. Odin, the god of wisdom, reigned over all the deities, the wisest and strongest. He watched over the battles of men and selected the most heroic of the fallen to feast with them in his great fortress, Valhalla. Thor, the son of Odin, was not only a powerful warrior, the defender of Asgard against the restive giants, but also a deity of order who saw to the keeping of faith between men and obedience to the treaties. They were gods and goddesses of plenty, of fertility, of love, of law, of the sea and ships, and uh, a multitude of animistic spirits who inhabited all things and beings of the earth. But the world order began to break down when the gods, greedy for riches, tortured the witch Gullevai, the maker of gold, to compel her to reveal her secrets. Discord now became rampant among the gods and men. The gods began to break their oaths, corruption, treachery, rivalry, and the greed began to dominate the world. With the breakdown of the primal unity, the days of gods and men of Asgard and Midgard were numbered. Inexorably, the violation of the world order would lead to Ragnarok, the death of the gods in a great conflict before Valhalla. The gods would go down in a terrible battle with the giants, Fenris the wolf and the serpent of Midgard. With the mutual destruction of all the combatants, humanity would too perish, and nothing would remain but bare rock and overflowing oceans in a void of cold and darkness. Having thus disintegrated into its beginnings, however, the world would be renewed, purged of its earlier evils and the corruption that destroyed it. Nor would the new world emerging from the void suffer another catastrophic end, for the second generation of gods and goddesses would learn from the mistakes of their antecedents. The prophetess, who recounts the story, tells us that humanity henceforth will live in joy for as long as one can foresee. In this Norse cosmography, there seems to be more than the old theme of eternal recurrence of a time sense that spins around perpetual cycles of birth, maturation, death and rebirth. Rather, one is aware of prophecy infused with historical trauma. The legend belongs to a little explored area of mythology that might be called myths of disintegration. 
Although the Ragnarok legend is known to be quite old, we know very little about when it appeared in the evolution of the Norse sagas. We do know that Christianity, with its bargain of eternal reward, came later to the Norsemen than to any other large ethnic group in Western Europe, and its roots were shallow for generations afterwards. The heathenism of the North had long made contact with the commerce of the South. During the Viking raids of Europe, the sacred places of the North had become polluted by gold, and the pursuit of riches was dividing kinsmen for kinsmen. Hierarchies erected by valor were being eroded by systems of privilege based on wealth. The clans and tribes were breaking down the oaths between men from which stemmed the unity of the primordial world were being dishonored, and the magic fountain that kept the world tree alive was being clogged by the debris of commerce. Brothers fight and slay one another, laments the prophetess. Children deny their own ancestry. This is the age of wind of wolf, until the very day when the world shall be no more. What haunts us in such myths of disintegration are not the histories, but their prophecies, like the Norsemen and perhaps even more like the people at the close of the Middle Ages, we sense that our world too is breaking down institutionally, culturally and physically. Whether we are faced with a new paradisical era or a catastrophe like the Norse Ragnarok, it's still unclear, but there can be no lengthy period of compromise between past and future in an ambiguous present. The reconstructive and the destructive tendencies in our own time are too much at odds with each other to admit of reconciliation. The social horizon presents the starkly conflicting prospect of an harmonized world with an ecological sensibility, based on a rich commitment to community, mutual aid and new technologies on the one hand, and the terrifying prospect of some sort of thermonuclear disaster or on the other. Our world, it would appear, will either undergo revolutionary changes so far-reaching in character that humanity will totally transform its social relations and its uh, very conception of life, or it will suffer an apocalypse that may well end humanity's tenure on the planet. The tension between these two prospects has already subverted the morale of the traditional social order. We have entered an era that consists no longer of institutional stabilization, but uh, one of institutional decay. A widespread alienation is developing toward the forms, the aspirations, the demands, and above all, the institutions of the established order. The most exuberant theatrical evidence of this alienation occurred in the 1960s, when the youth revolt in the early half of the decade exploded into what seemed to be a counterculture. Considerably more than protest and adolescent nihilism marked the period. Almost intuitively, new values of sensuousness, new forms of communal lifestyle, changes in dress, language, music, all born in the wave of a deep sense of impending social change, infused a sizable selection of an entire generation. We still do not know in what sense this wave began to ebb, uh, whether as a historic retreat or as a transformation into a serious project for inner and social development. That the symbols of this movement eventually became the artifacts for a new culture industry does not alter its far-reaching effects. Western society will never be the same again, all the sneers of its academics and its critics of narcissism notwithstanding. What makes this ceaseless movement of deinstitutionalization and delegitimation so significant is that it has found its bedrock in a vast stratum of Western society, 
alienation permeates not only the poor, but also the relatively affluent, not only the young, but also their elders, not only the visibly denied, but also the seemingly privileged. The prevailing order is beginning to lose the loyalty of social strata that traditionally raised us to its support and in which its roots were firmly planted in past periods. Crucial as this decay of institution and values may be, it by no means exhausts the problems that confront the existing society. Intertwined with the social crisis is a crisis that has emerged directly from man's exploitation of the planet. Established society is faced with a breakdown not only of its values and institutions, but also of its natural environment. This problem is not unique to our times. The desiccated wastelands of the Near East, where the arts of agriculture and urbanism had their beginnings, are evidence of ancient human despoilation. But this example pales before the massive destruction of the environment that has occurred since the days of the Industrial Revolution, and especially since the end of the Second World War. The damage inflicted on the environment by contemporary society encompasses the entire Earth. Volumes have been written on the immense losses of productive soil that occur annually in almost every continent of the Earth, on the extensive destruction of tree cover in areas vulnerable to erosion, on lethal air pollution episodes in major urban areas, on the worldwide diffusion of toxic agents from agriculture, industry and power producing installations, on the chemicalization of humanity's immediate environment with industrial wastes, pesticide residues and food additives. The exploitation and pollution of the earth has damaged not only the integrity of the atmosphere, climate, water resources, soil, flora and fauna of specific regions, but also the basic natural cycles on which all living things depend. Yet modern man's capacity for destruction is quitoxic evidence of humanity's capacity for reconstruction. The powerful technological agents we have unleashed against our, the environment include many of the very agents we require for its reconstruction. The knowledge and physical instruments for promoting a harmonization of humanity with nature and human with human are largely at hand or could easily be devised. Many of the physical principles used to construct such patently harmful facilities as conventional power plants, energy-consuming vehicles, surface mining equipment and the like could be directed to the construction of small-scale solar and wind energy devices, efficient means of transportation and energy-saving shelters. What we crucially lack is the consciousness and sensibility that will help us achieve such eminently desirable goals, a consciousness and a sensibility far broader than customarily meant by these terms. Our definitions must include not only the ability to reason logically and respond emotionally in a humanistic fashion, they must also include a fresh awareness of the relatedness between things and an imaginative insight into the possible. On this score, Marx was entirely correct to emphasize that the revolution required by our time must draw its poetry not from the past but from the future, from the humanistic potentialities that lie on the horizons of social life. The new consciousness and sensibility cannot be poetic alone. They must be also scientific, indeed. There is a level at which our consciousness must be neither poetry nor science, but a transcendence of both into a new realm of theory and practice, an artfulness that combines fancy with reason, imagination with logic, vision with technique. We cannot shed our scientific heritage without returning to a rudimentary technology with its shackles of material insecurity, toil and renunciation. 
And we cannot allow ourselves to be imprisoned within a mechanistic outlook and a dehumanizing technology with its shackles of alienation, competition and the brute denial of humanity's potentialities. Poetry and imagination must be integrated with science and technology, for we have evolved beyond an innocence that can be nourished exclusively by myths and dreams. Is there a scientific discipline that allows for the discipline of fancy imagination an artfulness? Can it encompass problems created by the social and environmental crisis of our time? Can it integrate critique with reconstruction theory with practice vision with technique? In almost every period since the Renaissance, a very close link has existed between radical advances in the natural sciences and upheavals in social thought. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the emerging sciences of astronomy and mechanics, with their liberating visions of a heliocentric world and the unity of local and cosmic motion, found their social counterparts in equally critical and rational social ideologies that challenge religious bigotry and political absolutism. The Enlightenment brought a new appreciation of sensory perception and the claims of human reason to divine a world that had been the ideological monopoly of the clergy. Later, anthropology and evolutionary biology demolished traditional static notions of the human enterprise, along with its myths of original creation and history as a theological calling. By enlarging the map and revealing the earthly dynamics of social history, these sciences reinforced the new doctrines of socialism with its ideal of human progress that followed the French Revolution. In view of the enormous dislocations that now confront us, our own era needs a more sweeping and insightful body of knowledge, scientific as well as social, to deal with our problems. Without reinforcing the gains of earlier scientific and social theories, we must develop a more rounded critical analysis of our relationship with the natural world. We must seek the foundations for a more reconstructive approach to the grave problems posed by the apparent contradictions between nature and society. We can no longer afford to remain captives to the tendency of the more traditional sciences to dissect phenomena and examine their fragments. We must combine them, relate them, and see them in their own totality as well as their specificity. In response to these needs, we have formulated a discipline unique to our age, social ecology. The more well-known term ecology was coined by Ernst Haeckel a century ago to denote the investigation of the interrelationships between animals, plants and their inorganic environment. Since Haeckel's day, uh, the term has been expanded to include the ecologies of cities, of health and the mind. This proliferation of a word into widely disparate areas may seem particularly decidable to an age that fervently seeks some kind of intellectual coherence and unity of perception, but it can also prove to be extremely treacherous. Like such newly arrived words as holism, decentralization and dialectics, the term ecology runs the peril of merely hanging in the air without any roots, context or texture. Often, it is used as a metaphor, an alluring catchword that loses the potentially compelling internal logic of its premises. Accordingly, the radical thrust of these words is easily neutralized. Holism evaporates into a mystical sigh, a rhetorical expression for ecological fellowship and community that ends with such in-group greetings and salutations as holistically yours. What was once a serious philosophical stance has been reduced to environmentalist quiche. Decentralization commonly means logistical alternatives to gigantism, not the human scale that would make an intimate and direct democracy possible. Ecology fares even worse. All too often it becomes a metaphor, like the word dialectics, for any kind of integration and development. 
Perhaps even more troubling, the world in recent years has been identified with a very crude form of natural engineering that m might well be called environmentalism. I am mindful that many ecologically oriented individuals use ecology and environmentalism interchangeably. Here I would like to draw a semantically convenient distinction. By environmentalism, I propose to designate a mechanistic instrumental outlook that sees nature as a passive habitat composed of objects such as animals, plants, minerals and the like that must merely be rendered more serviceable for human use. Given my use of the term, environmentalism tends to reduce nature to a storage bin of natural resources or raw materials. Within this context, very little of a social nature is spared from the environmentalist vocabulary. Cities become urban resources and their inhabitants human resources. If the word resources leaps out so frequently from environmentalistic discussions of nature, cities and people, an issue more important than the mere word play is at stake. Environmentalism, as I use this term, turns to view the ecological project for attaining a harmonious relationship between humanity and nature as a truth rather than a lasting equilibrium. The harmony of the environmentalist centers around the development of new techniques for plundering the natural world with minimal disruption of the human habitat. Environmentalism does not question the most basic premise of the present society, Notably, that humanity must dominate nature. Rather, it seeks to facilitate that notion by developing techniques for diminishing the hazards caused by the reckless despoilation of the environment. To distinguish ecology from environmentalism and from abstract, often obfuscatory definitions of the term, I must return to its original usage and explore its direct relevance to society. Put quite simply, ecology deals with the dynamic balance of nature, with the interdependence of uh, living and non-living things. Since nature also includes human beings, the science must include humanity's role in the human world, specifically the character, form and structure of humanity's relationship with other species and with the inorganic substrate of the biotic environment. From a critical viewpoint, Ecology opens to wide purview the vast disequilibrium that has emerged from humanity split with the natural world. One of nature's very unique species, Homo sapiens, has slowly and painstakingly developed from the natural world into a unique social world of its own. As both worlds interact with each other through highly complex phases of evolution, it has become as important to speak of a social ecology as to speak of a natural ecology. Let me emphasize that the failure to explore these phases of human evolution, which have yielded a succession of hierarchies, classes, cities, and finally states, is to make a mockery of the term social ecology. Unfortunately, this discipline has been beleaguered by self-professed adherents who continually try to collapse all the phases of natural and human development into a universal oneness, not wholeness, a yawning night in which all cows are black, to borrow one of Hegel's caustic phrases. If nothing else, our common use of the word species to denote the wealth of life around us should alert us to the fact of specificity, of particularity, the rich abundance of differentiated beings and things that enter into the very subject matter of natural ecology. To explore these differentia, to examine the faces and interfaces that enter into their making and into humanity's long development from animality to society, a development latent with problems and possibilities, is to make social ecology one of the most powerful disciplines from which to draw our critique of the present social order. But social ecology provides more than a critique of the split between humanity and nature, it also poses the need to heal them. Indeed, it poses the need to radically transcend them. 
As E.A. Goodkind pointed out, the goal of social ecology is wholeness and not the mere adding together of innumerable details collected at random and interpreted subjectively and insufficiently. The science deals with social and natural relationships in communities or ecosystems. In conceiving them holistically, that is to say, in terms of their mutual interdependence, social ecology seeks to unravel the forms and patterns of interrelationships that give intelligibility to a community, be it natural or social. Holism here is the result of a conscious effort to discern how the particulars of a community are arranged or how its geometry, as the Greeks might have put it, makes the whole more than the sum of its parts. Hence, the wholeness to which Goodkind refers is not to be mistaken for a spectral oneness that yields cosmic dissolution in a structureless nirvana. It is a richly articulated structure with a history and internal logic of its own. History, in fact, is as important as form or structure. To a large extent, the history of a phenomenon is the phenomenon itself. We are, in a real sense, everything that existed before us, and in turn, we can eventually become vastly more than we are. Surprisingly, very little in the evolution of life forms has been lost in natural and social evolution, indeed in our very bodies, as our embryonic development attests. Evolution lies within us, as well as around us, as parts of the very nature of our beings. For the present, it suffices to say that wholeness is not a bleak and differentiated universality that involves the reduction of a phenomenon to what it has in common with everything else. Nor is it a celestial omnipresent energy that replaces the vast material differentia of which the natural and social realms are composed. To the contrary, wholeness comprises the variegated structures, the articulations and the mediations that impart to the whole a rich variety of forms and thereby add unique qualitative properties to what a strictly analytic mind often reduces innumerable and random details. Terms like wholeness totality and even community have perilous nuances for a generation that has known fascism and other totalitarian ideologies. The words evoke images of a wholeness achieved through homogenization, standardization, and a repressive coordination of human beings. These fears are reinforced by a wholeness that seems to provide an inexorable finality to the course of human history, one that implies a superhuman, narrowly technological concept of social law and denies the ability of a human will and individual choice to shape the course of social events. Such notions of social law and technology have been used to achieve a ruthless subjugation of the individual to superhuman forces beyond human control. Our century has been afflicted by a plethora of totalitarian ideologies that placing human beings in the service of history have denied them a place in the service of their own humanity. Actually, such a totalitarian concept of wholeness stands sharply at odds with what ecologies denotes by the term. In addition to comprehending its heightened awareness of form and structure, we now have to come to a very important tenet of ecology, Ecological wholeness is not an immutable homogeneity, but rather the very opposite, a dynamic unity of diversity. In nature, balance and harmony are achieved by ever-changing differentiation, by ever-expanding diversity. Ecological stability, in effect, is a function not of simplicity and homogeneity, but of complexity and variety. The capacity of an ecosystem to retain its integrity depends not on the uniformity of the environment, but on its diversity. A striking example of this tenet can be drawn from experiences with ecological strategies for cultivating food. 
farmers have repeatedly met with disastrous results because of the conventional emphasis on single crop approaches to agriculture or monoculture. To use a widely accepted term for those endless wheat and corn fields that extend to the horizon in many parts of the world. Without the mixed crops that normally provide both the countervailing forces and mutualistic support that come with mixed populations of plants and animals, the entire agricultural situation in an area has been known to collapse. Benign insects become pests because their natural controls, including birds and small mammals, have been removed. The soil, lacking earthworms, nitrogen-fixing bacteria and green manure in sufficient quantities, is reduced to mere sand, a mineral medium for absorbing enormous quantities of inorganic nitrogen salts, which were originally supplied more cyclically and timed more appropriately for crop growth in the ecosystem. In reckless disregard for the complexity of nature and for the subtle requirements of plant and animal life, the agricultural situation is crudely simplified. Its needs must now be satisfied by highly soluble synthetic fertilizers that percolate into drinking water and by dangerous pesticides that remain as residues in food. A high standard of food cultivation that was once achieved by diversity of crops and animals, one that was free of lasting toxic agents and probably more healthful nutritionally, is now barely approximated by single crops whose main supports are toxic chemicals and highly simple nutrients. If we assume that the thrust of natural evolution has been toward increasing complexity, that the colonization of the planet by life has been possible only as a result of biotic variety, a prudent rescaling of man hubris should call for caution in distributing natural processes. That living things emerging ages ago from their primal aquatic habitat to colonize the most inhospitable areas of the Earth have created the rich biosphere that now covers it, it has been possible only because of life's incredible mutability and the enormous legacy of life forms inherited from its long development. Many of these life forms, even the most primal and simplest, have never disappeared, however much they have been modified by evolution. The simple algal forms that mark the beginnings of plant life and the simple invertebrates that mark the beginnings of animal life still exist in large numbers. They comprise the preconditions for the existence of more complex organic beings, to which they provide sustenance, the sources of the composition, and even atmospheric oxygen and carbon dioxide. Although they may antedate the higher plants and mammals by over a billion years, they interrelate with their more complex descendants in often unrivable ecosystems. To assume that science commands this vast nexus of organic and inorganic interrelationships in all its details is worse than arrogance, it's sheer stupidity. If unity in diversity forms one of the cardinal tenets of ecology, the wealth of biota that exists in a single acre of soil leads us to still another basic ecological tenet, the need to allow for a high degree of natural spontaneity. The compelling dictum, respect for nature, has concrete implications. To assume that our knowledge of this complex, richly textured and perpetually changing natural kaleidoscope of life forms lends itself to a degree of mastery that allows us free reign in manipulating the biosphere is sheer foolishness. Thus, a considerable amount of leeway must be permitted for a natural spontaneity for the diverse biological forces that yield a variegated ecological situation. Working with nature requires that we foster the biotic variety that emerges from a spontaneous development of natural phenomena. 
I hardly mean that we must surrender ourselves to a mythical nature that is beyond all human comprehension and intervention, a nature that demands human awe and subservience. Perhaps the most obvious conclusion we can draw from these ecological tenets is Charles Eaton's sensitive observation. The world's future has to be managed, but its management would not be just like a game of chess, but more like steering a boat. What ecology, both natural and social, can hope to teach us is the way to find the current and understand the direction of the stream. What ultimately distinguishes an ecological outlook as uniquely liberatory is the challenge it raises to conventional notions of hierarchy. Let me emphasize, however, that this challenge is implicit. It must be painstakingly elicited from the discipline of ecology, which is permeated by conventional scientific biases. Ecologists are rarely aware that their science provides strong philosophical underpinnings for a non-hierarchical view of reality. Like many natural scientists, they resist philosophical generalizations as alien to their research and conclusions, a prejudice that is itself a philosophy rooted in the Anglo-American empirical tradition. Moreover, they follow their colleagues in other disciplines and model their notions of science on physics. This prejudice, which goes back to Galileo's day, has led to a widespread acceptance of systems theory in ecological circles. While systems theory has its place in the repertoire of science, it can easily become an all-encompassing quantitative reductionist theory of energetics if it acquires preeminence over qualitative descriptions of ecosystems, that is, descriptions rooted in organic evolution, variety and holism. Whatever the merits of systems theory as an account of energy flow through an ecosystem, the primacy it gives to this quantitative aspect of ecosystem analysis fails to recognize life forms as more than consumers and producers of calories. Having presented these caveats, I must emphasize that ecosystems cannot be meaningfully described in hierarchical terms. Whether plant-animal communities actually contain quote-unquote dominant and quote-unquote submissive individuals within a species can be argued at great length. But to rank species within an ecosystem, that is to say between species, is anthropomorphism at its crudest. As Addison Jolly has observed, the notion of animal hierarchies has a checkered history. Schelderup Ebbe, who discovered the pecking order of hens, enlarged his findings to a Teutonic theory of despotism in the universe. For instance, water eroding a stone was quote-unquote dominant. Schelderup Ebbe called animals ranking dominance, and many research workers within an AHA uh, recognize dominance uh, hierarchies uh, in many vertebrate groups. If we recognize that every ecosystem can also be viewed as a food web, we can think of it as a circular interlacing nexus of plant-animal relationships rather than a stratified pyramid with man at the apex that includes such widely varying creatures as microorganisms and large mammals. What ordinarily puzzles anyone who sees foot web diagrams for the first time is the impossibility of discerning a point of entry into the nexus. The web can be entered at any point and leads back to its point of departure without any apparent exit. Aside from the energy provided by sunlight and dissipated by radiation, the system to all appearances is closed. Each species, be it a form of bacteria or deer, is knitted together in a network of interdependence, however indirect the links may be. A predator in the web is also prey. Even if the lowliest of organisms merely makes it ill 
or helps to consume it after death. Nor is predation the sole link that unites one species with another. A resplendent literature now exists that reveals the enormous extent to which symbiotic mutualism is a major factor in fostering ecological stability and organic evolution. That plants and animals continually adapt to unwittingly aid each other, be it by an exchange of biochemical functions that are mutually beneficial, or even dramatic instances of physical assistance and succor. It has opened an entirely new perspective on the nature of ecosystem stability and development. The more complex the food web, the less unstable it will be if one or several species are removed. Hence, enormous significance must be given to interspecific diversity and complexity within the system as a whole. Striking breakdowns will occur in simple ecosystems such as arctic and desert ones, say if wolves that control foraging animal populations are exterminated, or if uh, a sizable number of reptiles that control rodent populations in arid ecosystems are removed. By contrast, the great variety of biota that populate temperate and tropical ecosystems can afford losses of carnivores or herbivores without suffering major dislocations. Why do terms borrow from human social hierarchies acquire such remarkable weight when plant-animal relations are described? Do ecosystems really have a uh, king of the beast and uh, lowly serfs? Do certain insects enslave others? Does one species exploit another? The promiscuous use of these terms in ecology raises many far-reaching issues. That the terms are laden with socially charged values is almost too obvious to warrant extensive discussion. Many individuals exhibit a pathetic gullibility in the way they deal with nature as a dimension of society. A snarling animal is neither vicious nor savage, nor does it misbehave or earn punishment because it reacts appropriately to certain stimuli. By making such anthropomorphic judgments about natural phenomena, we deny the integrity of nature. Even more sinister is the widespread use of hierarchical terms to provide natural phenomena with intelligibility or order. What this procedure does accomplish is reinforce human social hierarchies by justifying the command of men and women as innate features of the quote-unquote natural order. Human domination is thereby transcribed into the genetic code as biologically immutable, together with the subordination of the young by the old, women by men, and man by man. The very promiscuity with which hierarchical terms are used to organize all differentia in nature is inconsistent. A quote-unquote queen bee does not know she is a queen. The primary activity of a beehive is reproductive and its quote-unquote division of labor, uh, to use a grossly abused phrase, lacks any meaning in a large sexual organ that performs no authentic economic functions. The purpose of the hive is to create more bees. The honey that animals and people acquire from it is a natural largesse. Within the ecosystems, bees are adapted more to meeting plant reproductive needs by spreading pollen than to meeting important animal needs. The analogy between a beehive and a society, an analogy social theorists have often found too irresistible to avoid, is a striking commentary on the extent to which our visions of nature are shaped by self-serving social interests. 
To deal with so-called insect hierarchies, the way we deal with so-called animal hierarchies, or worse, to grossly ignore the very different functions animal communities perform, is analogic reasoning carried to the point of the preposterous. Primates relate to each other in ways that seem to involve dominance and submission for widely disparate reasons. Yet, terminologically and conceptually, they are placed under the same quote-unquote hierarchical rubric as quote-unquote insect societies, despite the different forms they assume and their precarious stability. Baboons on the African savannas have been singled out as the most rigid hierarchical troops in the primate world, but this rigidity evaporates once we examine their quote-unquote ranking order in a forest habitat. Even on the savannas, it is questionable whether quote-unquote alpha males quote-unquote rule, or control or coordinate relationships within the troop. Arguments can be presented for choosing any of these words, each of which has a clearly different meaning when it is used in a human social context. Seemingly, quote-unquote patriarchal primate quote-unquote harems can be as loose sexually as brothels depending on whether a female is in estrus, changes have occurred in the habitat, or the quote-unquote patriarch is simply diffident about the whole situation. Baboons, it is worth noting, are monkeys, despite the presumed similarity of their savanna habitat to that of early hominids. They are branched off from the hominoid evolutionary tree more than 20 million years ago. Our closest evolutionary cousins, the great apes, tend to demolish these prejudices about hierarchy completely. Of the four great apes, gibbons have no apparent ranking system at all. Chimpanzees, regarded by many primatologists as the most human-like of all apes, form such fluid kinds of stratification and, depending upon the ecology of the area, which may be significantly affected by research workers, establish such unstable types of association that the word hierarchy becomes an obstacle to understanding their behavioral characteristics. Orangutans seems to have little of what could be called dominance and submission relations. The mountain gorilla, despite of its formidable reputation, exhibits very little quote-unquote stratification except for predator challenges and internal aggression. All these examples help to justify Elise Boulding's complaint that the quote-unquote primate behavior model, favored by overly hierarchical and patriarchal writers on animal-human parallels, is based more on the baboon, not the gibbon. In contrast to the baboon, observes Boulding, the gibbon is closer to us physically, and one might add, on the primate evolutionary scale. Our choice of a primate role model is clearly culturally determined, she concludes. Who wants to be like the unaggressive vegetarian food-sharing gibbons, where father is as much involved in child-rearing as mother is, and where everyone lives in small family groups with little aggregation beyond that? Much better to match with the baboons who live in large, tightly knit groups carefully closed against outsider baboons where everybody knows who's in charge and where mother looks after the babies while father is out hunting and fishing. In fact, Boulding concedes too much about the savanna dwelling primates. Even if the term dominance were stretched to include queen bees and alpha baboons, Specific acts of coercion by individual animals can hardly be called domination. Acts do not constitute institutions, episodes do not make history, and highly structured insect behavioral patterns rooted in instinctual drives are too inflexible to be regarded as social. Unless hierarchy is to be used in Shelderup Ebba's cosmic 
sense, dominance and submission must be viewed as institutionalized relationships. Relationships that living things literally institute or create, but which are neither ruthlessly fixed by instinct on the one hand, nor idiosyncratic on the other. By this I mean that they must comprise a clearly social structure of coercive and privileged ranks that exist apart from the idiosyncratic individuals who seem to be dominant within a given community, a hierarchy that is guided by a social logic that goes beyond individual interactions or inborn patterns of behavior. Such traits are evident enough in human society when we speak of quote-unquote self-perpetuating bureaucracies and explore them without considering the individual bureaucrats who compose them. Yet, when we turn to non-human primates, what people commonly recognize as hierarchy, status, domination, are precisely the idiosyncratic behaviors of individual animals. Mike Jane van Lawit Goodall's alpha chimpanzee acquired his status by rambunctiously charging upon a group of males while noisily hitting on two empty kerosene cans. At which point in her narrative, uh, van Lawit Goodall wonders, would Mike have become an alpha male without the kerosene cans? She replies that the animal's use of man-made objects is probably an indication of superior intelligence. Whether such shadowy distinctions in intelligence rather than aggressiveness, willfulness or arrogance produce an alpha male or not is evidence that more of the subtle projection of historically conditioned human values on a primate group than scientific objectivity that ethology likes to claim for itself. The seemingly hierarchical traits of many animals are more like variations in the links of a chain than organized stratifications of the kind we find in human societies and institutions. Even the so-called class societies of the Northwest Indians, as we shall see, are chain-like links between individuals rather than the class-like links between strata that early Euro-American invaders uh, so naively projected on Indians from their own social world. If acts do not constitute institutions, and episodes do not constitute history, individual behavior traits do not form strata or classes. Social strata are made of sterner stuff. They have a life of their own apart from the personalities who give them substance. How is ecology to avoid the analogic reasoning that has made so much of ethology and sociobiology seem like suspicious projection of human society into nature? Are there any terms that provide a common meaning to unity in diversity, natural spontaneity and non-hierarchical relations in nature and society? In view of the many tenets that appear in natural ecology, why stop with these alone? Why not introduce other, perhaps less savory, ecological notions like predation and aggression into society? In fact, nearly all of these questions became major issues in social theory in the early part of the century, when the so-called Chicago School of Urban Sociology zealously tried to apply almost every known concept of natural ecology to the development and physiology of the city. Robert Park, Ernus Borges and Roderick McKenzie, enamored with the new science, actually imposed a stringently biological model on their studies of Chicago, with a forcefulness and inspiration that dominated American urban sociology for two generations. Their tenets included ecological succession, uh, spatial distribution, sonal distribution, anabolic-catabolic balances, and even competition and natural selection that could easily have pushed the school towards an insidious form of social Darwinism had it not been for the liberal biases of its founders. Despite its admirable empirical results, the school was to founder on its metaphoric reductionism. Applied indiscriminately, the category ceased to be meaningful. 
when Park compared the emergence of certain specialized municipal utilities to successional dominance by other plant species that climax is in a beach or pine forest, the analogy was patently forced and absurdly contorted. His comparison of ethnic, cultural, occupational and economic groups to plant invasions revealed a lack of theoretical discrimination that reduced human social features to plant ecological features. What Park and his associates lacked was the philosophical equipment for singling out the faces that both unite and separate natural and social phenomena in a developmental continuum. Thus, merely superficial similarity became outright identity, with the unfortunate result that social ecology was repeatedly reduced to natural ecology. The richly mediated evolution of the natural into the social that could have been used to yield a meaningful selection of ecological categories was not part of the school's theoretical equipment. Whenever we ignore the way human social relationships transcend plant-animal relationships, our views tend to bifurcate in two erroneous directions. Either we succumb to a heavy-handed dualism that harshly separates the natural from the social, or we fall into a crude reductionism that dissolves the one into the other. In either case, we really cease to think out the issues involved. We merely grasp for the least uncomfortable solution to a highly complex problem, namely the need to analyze phrases through which mute biological nature increasingly becomes conscious human nature. What makes unity in diversity in nature more than a suggestive ecological metaphor for unity in diversity in society is the underlying philosophical concept of wholeness. By wholeness, I mean varying levels of actualization, an unfolding of the wealth of particularities that are latent in an as yet undeveloped potentiality. This potentiality may be a newly planted seed, a newly born infant, a newly born community or a newly born society. When Hegel describes in a famous passage the unfolding of human knowledge in biological terms, the feed is almost exact. The bud disappears in the bursting forth of the blossom, and one might say that the former is refuted by the latter. Similarly, when the fruit appears, the blossom is shown up in its turn as a false manifestation of the plant, and the fruit now emerges as the truth of it instead. These forms are not just distinguished from one another, they also supplant one another as mutually incompatible. Yet, at the same time, their fluid nature makes them moments of an organic unity in which they not only do not conflict, but in which each is necessary as the other, and this mutual necessity alone constitutes the life of the whole. I have turned to this remarkable passage because Hegel does not mean it to be merely metaphoric. His biological example and his social subject matter converge in ways that transcend both, notably, as similar aspects of a larger process. Life itself, as a distinguished form from the non-living, emerges from the inorganic latent with all the particularities it has immanently produced from the logic of its most nascent forms of self-organization. So the society, as distinguished from biology, humanity as distinguished from animality, and individuality as distinguished from humanity. It is not spiteful manipulation of Hegel's famous maxim, the true is the whole, to declare that the whole is the true. One can take this reversal of terms to mean that the true lies in the self-consummation of a process through its development, in the flowering of its latent particularities into their fullness or wholeness, just as the potentialities of a child achieve expression in the wealth of experiences and the physical growth that enter into adulthood. We must not get caught up in direct comparisons between plants, animals and human beings, or between plant, animal ecosystems and human communities. None of these is completely congruent with another. 
we would be regressing in our views to those of Parks, Burgess, and Mackenzie, not to mention our current bouquet of sociobiologists, where we lack enough to make this equation. It is not in the particulars of differentiation that plant-animal communities are ecologically united with human communities, but rather in their logic differentiation. Wholeness, in fact, is completeness. The dynamic stability of the whole derives from a visible level of completeness in human communities as in climax ecosystems. What unites these modes of wholeness and completeness, however different they are in their specificity and their qualitative distinctness, is the logic of development itself. A climax forest is whole and complete as a result of the same unifying process, the same dialectic, that a particular social form is whole and complete. When wholeness and completeness are viewed as the result of an imminent dialectic within phenomena, we do no more violence to the uniqueness of these phenomena than the principle of gravity does violence to the uniqueness of objects that fall within its uh, lawfulness. In this sense, the ideal of human roundedness, a product of the rounded community, is the legitimate here to the ideal of a stabilized nature, a product of the rounded natural environment. Marx tried to root humanity's identity and self-discovery in its productive interaction with nature. But I must add that not only does humanity plays its imprint on the natural world and transform it, but also nature places its imprint on the human world and transforms it. To use the language of hierarchy against itself, it is not only we who tame nature, but also nature that tames us. These turns of phrase should be taken as more than metaphors, lest it seem that I have rarefied the concept of wholeness into an abstract dialectical principle. Let me note that natural ecosystems and human communities interact with each other in very existential ways. Our animal nature is never so distant from our social nature that we can remove ourselves from the organic world outside us and the one within us. From our embryonic development to our layered brain, we partly recapitulate our own natural evolution. We are not so remote from our primate ancestry that we can ignore its physical legacy in our stereoscopic vision, acuity of intelligence, and grasping fingers. We face into society as individuals in the same way that society, facing out of nature, comes into itself. These continuities, to be sure, are obvious enough. What is often less obvious is the extent to which nature itself is a realm of potentiality for the emergence of social differentia. Nature is as much a precondition for development of society, not merely its emergence as techniques, labor, language, and mind. And it is a precondition, not merely in William Petty's sense, that if labor is the father of wealth, nature is mother. This formula, so dear to Marx, actually slights nature by imparting to it the patriarchal notion of feminine passivity. The affinities between nature and society are more active than we care to admit. Very specific forms of nature, very specific ecosystems, constitute the ground for very specific forms of society. At the risk of using a highly embattled phrase, I might say that a quote-unquote historical materialism of natural development uh, could be written that would transform the quote-unquote passive nature, uh, the object of human labor, into active nature, the, the creator of human labor. Labor's metabolism within nature cuts both ways, so that nature interacts with humanity to yield the actualization of their common potentialities in the natural and social worlds. An interaction of this kind, in which terms like father and mother strike a false note, can be stated very concretely. 
The recent emphasis on bioregions as frameworks for various human communities provides a strong case for the need to readapt techniques and work styles to accord with the requirements and possibilities of particular ecological areas. Bioregional requirements and possibilities place a heavy burden on humanity's claims of sovereignty over nature and autonomy from its needs. If it is true that men make history, but not under conditions of their own choosing, as Marx said, it is no less true that history makes society, but not under conditions of its own choosing. The hidden dimension that lurks in this world play with Marx's famous formula is the natural history that enters into the making of social history. But as active, concrete, existential nature that emerges from stage to stage of its own ever more complex development in the form of equally complex and dynamic ecosystems. Our ecosystems, in turn, are interlinked in highly dynamic and complex bioregions. How concrete the hidden dimension of social development is and how much humanity's claims to sovereignty must defer to it has only recently become evident from our need to design an alternative technology that is adaptive to a bioregion as it is productive to society. Hence, our concept of wholeness is not a finished tapestry of natural and social relations that we can exhibit to the hungry eyes of sociologists. It is a fecund natural history, ever active and ever changing, the way childhood presses toward and is absorbed into youth and youth into adulthood. The need to bring a sense of history into nature is as compelling as the need to bring a sense of history into society. An ecosystem is never a random community of plants and animals that occurs merely by chance. It has potentiality, direction, meaning, and self-realization in its own right. To view an ecosystem as given uh, a bad habit which scientism inculcates in its theoretically neutral observer is as ahistorical and superficial as to view a human community as given. Both have a history that gives intelligibility and order to their natural relationships and directions to their development. At its inception, human history is largely natural history, as well as social, as traditional kinship structures and the sexual division of labor clearly indicate. Whether or not Natural history is the slime, to use Sartre's uh, uh, maladroit term, that clings to humanity and prevents its rational fulfillment will be considered later. For the present, one fact should be made clear. Human history can never disengage itself or disembed itself from nature. It will always be embedded in nature, as we shall see whether we are inclined to call that nature a slime or a fecund mother. What may prove to be the most demanding test of our human genius is the kind of nature we will foster, one that is richly organic and complex, or one that is inorganic and disastrously simplified. Humanity's involvement with nature not only runs deep, but takes on forms more increasingly subtle than even the most sophisticated theories could have anticipated. Our knowledge of this involvement is still, as it were, in its uh, prehistory. To Ange Bloch, we not only share a common history with nature, all the difference between nature and society aside, but also a common destiny. As he observes, Nature, in its final manifestation, like history in its final manifestation, lies at the horizon of the future. The more a common technique, uh, alliance technique, is attainable instead of one that is external, one that is mediated with the productivity, mit productivität of uh, nature, the more we can be sure that the frozen powers of a frozen nature will again be emancipated. Nature is not something that can be consigned to the past. 
Rather, it is the construction site that has not yet been cleared, the building tools that have not yet been attained in an adequate form for the human house that itself does not yet exist in an adequate form. The ability of problem-laden natural subjectivity to participate in the construction of this house is the objective utopian correlate of the human utopian fantasy conceived in concrete terms. Therefore, it is certain that the human house stands not only in history and on the ground of human activity, it stands primarily on the ground of a mediated natural subjectivity on the construction side of nature. Nature's conceptual frontier, uh, Grenz Begriff, is not the beginning of human history, where nature, which is always present in history and always surrounds it, turns into the site of the human sovereign realm, Regnum Hominis, but rather where it turns into the adequate site for the adequate human house, as an unalienated, mediated good. Und sie unentfettment auf Gecht als vermitteltes Gut. One can take issue with the emphasis Bloch gives to human sovereignty in the interaction with nature and the structural phraseology that infiltrates his brilliant grasp of the organic nature of that interaction. Das Prinzip Hoffnung, the principle of hope, was written in the early 1940s, a grim and embattled period when such a conceptual framework was totally alien to the anti-naturalistic, indeed militaristic spirit of the times. His insight, beggars are hindsight. Redolent with its pop ecological terminology and its queasy mysticism. In any case, enough has been written about the differences between nature and society. Today, together with Bloch, it would be valuable to shift our emphasis to the commonalities of nature and society, provided we are wary enough to avoid those mindless leaps from the one to the other as though they were not related by the rich phrases of development that authentically unite them. Spontaneity enters into social ecology in much the same way as it enters into natural ecology, as a function of diversity and complexity. Ecosystems are much too variegated to be delivered over completely to what Ernst Bloch called the Regnum Hominis, or at least to humanity's claim of sovereignty over nature. But we may justly ask if this is any less true of social complexity and history's claims of sovereignty over humanity. Do the self-appointed scientists or guardians of society know enough their normally self-serving views aside about the complex factors that make for social development to pressure to control them? And even after the adequate form for the human house has been discovered and given substantiality, how sure can we be of their disinterested sense of service? History is replete with accounts of miscalculation by leaders, parties, factions, guardians, and vanguards. If nature is blind, uh, society is equally blind when it presumes to know itself completely, whether as a social science, social theory, systems analysis, or even a social ecology. Indeed, world spirits from Alexander to Lenin have not always served humanity well. They have exhibited a willful arrogance that has damaged the social environment as disastrously as the arrogance of ordinary men has damaged the natural environment. Great historical eras of transition reveal that the rising flood of social change must be permitted to find its own level spontaneously. Vanguard organizations have produced repeated catastrophes where they sought to force changes that people and the conditions of their time could not sustain materially, ideologically or morally. Where forced social changes were not nourished by an educated and informed popular consciousness, they were eventually enforced by terror, and the movements themselves have turned savagely upon and devour their most cherished humanistic and liberatory ideals. Our own century is closing under the shadow of an event that has totally beclouded the future of humanity, notably the Russian Revolution and its terrifying 
sequelae, where the revolution, unforced and easily achieved by the popular movement, ended and Lenin's coup d'etat of October 1917 replaced it, can be easily fixed and dated. But how the will of a small cadre, abetted by the demoralization and stupidity of its opponents, turned success into failure in the very name of success is the more difficult to explain. That the movement would have come to rest had it been left to its own spontaneous popular momentum and self-determination, possibly with gains that might have reinforced more advanced social developments abroad, is perhaps the safest judgment we can make with the hindsight time has given us. Social change, particularly social revolution, tends to find its worst enemies in leaders whose wills supplant the spontaneous movements of the people. Hubris in social evolution is as dangerous as it is in natural evolution, and for the same reasons. In both cases, the complexity of a situation, the limitations of time and place, and the prejudices that filter into what often merely appear as foresight conceal the multitude of particulars that are truer to reality than any ideological preconceptions and needs. I do not mean to deny the superadded significance of will, insight and knowledge that must inform human spontaneity in the social world. In nature, by contrast, spontaneity operates within a more restrictive set of conditions. A natural ecosystem finds its climax in the greatest degree of stability it can attain within its given level of possibilities. We know, of course, that this is not a passive process. But beyond the level and stability an ecosystem can achieve and the apparent striving it exhibits, it reveals no motivation and choice. Its stability, given its potentialities and what Aristotle called its entelechy, is an end in itself, just as the function of a beehive is to produce bees. A climax ecosystem brings to rest, for a time, the interrelationships that comprise it. By contrast, the social realm raises the objective possibility of freedom and self-consciousness as the superadded function of stability. The human community, at whatever level it comes to rest, remains incomplete until it achieves uninhibited volition and self-consciousness, or what we call freedom, a complete state, I should add, that is actually the point of departure for a new beginning. How much human freedom rests on the stability of the natural ecosystem in which it is always embedded, what it means in a larger philosophical sense beyond mere survival, and what standards it evolves from its shared history with the entire world of life and its own social history, are subjects for the rest of this book. Within this highly complex context of ideas, we must now try to transpose the non-hierarchical character of natural ecosystems to society. What renders social ecology so important is that it offers no case whatsoever for hierarchy in nature and society. It decisively challenges the very function of hierarchy as a stabilizing or ordering principle in both realms. The association of order as such with hierarchy is ruptured. And this association is ruptured without rupturing the association of nature with society, as sociology, in its well-meaning opposition to sociobiology, has been wont do. In contrast to sociologists, we do not have to render the social world so supremely autonomous from nature that we are obliged to dissolve the continuum that faces nature into society. In short, we do not have to accept the brute tenets of sociobiology that link us crudely to nature at one extreme or the naive tenets of sociology that cleave us sharply from nature at the other extreme. Although hierarchy does exist in the present-day society, it need not continue, irrespective of its lack of meaning or reality for nature. 
But the case against hierarchy is not contingent on its uniqueness as a social phenomenon. Because hierarchy threatens the existence of social life today, it cannot remain a social fact. Because it threatens the integrity of organic nature, it will not continue to do so, given the harsh verdict of uh, quote-unquote mute and quote-unquote blind nature. Our continuity with non-hierarchical nature suggests that a non-hierarchical society is no less random than an ecosystem. That freedom is more than the absence of constraint that the Anglo-American tradition of mere pluralism and institutional heterogeneity yields substantially less than a social ecosystem. Such concepts have been argued with telling effect. In fact, democracy as the apotheosis of social freedom has been sufficiently denatured, as Benjamin R. Barber has emphasized, to yield the gradual displacement of participation by representation. Where democracy in its classical form meant quite literally rule by the demos, by the plebs, by the people themselves, it now often seems to mean little more than elite rule sanctioned through the device of representation by the people. Competing elites vie for the support of a public whose popular sovereignty is reduced to the pathetic right to participate in choosing the tyrant who will rule it. Perhaps more significantly, the concept of a public sphere of a body politic has been literally dematerialized by a seeming heterogeneity, more precisely an automization that reaches from the institutional to the personal, that has replaced uh, political coherence with chaos. The displacement of public virtue by personal rights has yielded the subversion not only of a unifying ethical principle that once gave substance to the very notion of a public, but the very personhood that gave substance to the notion of right. A broad, frequently raised question remains to be answered. To what extent does nature have a reality of its own that we can legitimately invoke? Assuming that nature really exists, how much do we know about the natural world that is not exclusively social, or to be even more restrictive, the product of our own subjectivity? That nature is all that is non-human or more broadly non-social is a presumption rooted in more than rational discourse. It lies at the heart of an entire theory of knowledge, an epistemology that sharply bifurcates into objectivity and subjectivity. Since the Renaissance, the idea that knowledge lies locked within the mind, closeted by its own supernatural limitations and insights, has been the foundation for all our doubts about the very existence of a coherent constellation that can even be called nature. This idea is the foundation for an anti-naturalistic body of epistemological theories. The claim of epistemology to adjudicate the validity of knowledge as a formal and abstract inquiry has always been opposed to the claim of history to treat knowledge as a problem of genesis, not merely of knowing in a formal and abstract sense. From this historical standpoint, mental processes do not live a life of their own. Their seemingly autonomous construction of the world is actually inseparable from the way they are constructed by the world, a world that is richly historical, not only in a social sense, but in a natural one as well. I do not mean that nature knows things that we do not know, but rather that we are the very knowingness of nature, the embodiment of nature's evolution into intellect, mind and self-reflexivity. In the abstract world of Cartesian, Lockean and Kantian epistemology, this proposition is difficult to demonstrate. Renaissance and post-Renaissance epistemology lack sense of historicity. If it looks back at all the history of mind, uh, it does so within a context so overwhelmingly social and from a historical level so far removed from the biological genesis of mind that it can never make contact with nature. Its very claim to modernity 
has been a systematic unraveling of the interface between nature and mind that Hellenic thought tried to establish. This interface has been replaced by an unbridgeable dualism between mentality and the external world. In Descartes, dualism occurs between soul and body, in Locke, between the perceiving senses and perceived world, in Kant, between mind and external reality. Thus, the problem of nature's knowingness has traditionally been seen from the knowing end of a long social history rather than from its beginnings. When this history is instead viewed from its origins, mentality and its continuity with nature acquires a decisively different aspect. An authentic epistemology is the physical anthropology of the mind, of the human brain, not the cultural clutter of history that obstructs our view of the brain's genesis in nature and its evolution in society conceived as a unique elaboration of natural phenomena. In the same vein, I do not wish to accord mind uh, a sovereignty over nature that it patently lacks. Nature is a perpetual kaleidoscope of changes and fecundity that resists hard and fast categorization. Mind can grasp the essence of this change, but never all of its details. Yet it is precisely in matters of detail that human hubris proves to be the most vulnerable. To return to Charles Eton's uh, sensitive metaphors, we have learned to navigate our way through the deeper waters of this natural world, but not through the countless and changing reefs that always render our debarkment precarious. It is here where the details of the shoreline count so tellingly that we do well not to ignore the currents that experience assures us are safe and that will spare us from the dangers of foundering. Ultimately, organic knowledge is mobilized insight that seeks to know nature within nature, not to abandon analysis from mysticism or dialectic for intuition. Our own thinking is itself a natural process, albeit deeply conditioned by society and richly textured by social evolution. Our capacity to bring thought into resonance with its organic history, its evolution from the highly reactive organic molecules that form the fundament for the sensitivity of more complex ones, the extravagant cloudburst of life forms that follows, and the evolution of the nervous system, is part of the knowledge of knowing that provides thought with an organic integument as real as the intellectual tools we acquire from society. More than intuition and faith, Thought is really as real as birth and death, when we first begin to know and when we finally cease to know. Hence, nature abides in epistemology as surely as parent abides in its child. What often is mistakenly dismissed as the intuitive face of knowledge is the truth that our animality gives to our humanity and our embryo stage of development to our adulthood. When we finally divorce from these depth faces of our being and thinking from our bodies and minds, we have done worse than narrow our epistemological claims to Kantian judgments based on a harsh dualism between thought and nature. We have divided our intellects from ourselves, our state of mind from the development of our bodies, our insight from our hindsight, and our understanding from its ancient memories. In more concrete terms, what tantalizing issues does social ecology raise for our time and our future? In establishing a more advanced interface with nature, will it be possible to achieve a new balance between humanity and nature by sensitively tailoring our agricultural practices, urban areas and technologies to the natural requirements of a region and its ecosystems? Can we hope to manage the natural environment by a drastic decentralization of agriculture which will make it possible to cultivate land as though it were a garden balanced by diversified fauna and flora? Will these changes require the decentralization of our cities into moderate-sized communities, creating a new balance between town and country? What technology will be required to achieve these goals and avoid the further pollution of the Earth? 
What institutions will be required to create a new public sphere? What social relations to foster a new ecological sensibility? What forms of work to render human practice playful and creative? What sizes of populations of communities to scale life to human dimensions controllable by all? What kind of poetry? Concrete questions, ecological, social, political, and behavioral, rush like a flood heretofore dammed up by the constraints of traditional ideologies and habits of thought. The answers we provide to these questions have a direct bearing on whether humanity can survive on the planet. The trends in our time are visibly directed against ecological diversity. In fact, they point toward brute simplification of the entire biosphere. Complex food chains in the soil and on the Earth's surface are being ruthlessly undermined by the fatuous application of industrial techniques to agriculture. Consequently, soil has been reduced in many areas to a mere sponge for absorbing simple chemical nutrients. The cultivation of single crops over vast stretches of land is effacing natural, agricultural, and even physiographic variety. Immense urban belts are encroaching unrelentingly on the countryside, replacing flora and fauna with concrete, metal and glass, and enveloping large regions in a haze of atmospheric pollutants. In this mass urban world, human experience itself becomes crude and elemental, subject to brute noisy stimuli and crass bureaucratic manipulation. A national division of labor, standardized along industrial lines, is replacing regional and local variety, reducing entire continents to immense smoking factories and cities to garish plastic supermarkets. In this confluence of social and ecological crises, we can no longer afford to be unimaginative. We can no longer afford to do without utopian thinking. The crises are too serious and the possibilities too sweeping to be resolved by customary modes of thought, the very sensibilities that produce these crises in the first place. Years ago, the French students in the May-June uprising of 1968 expressed this sharp contrast of alternatives magnificently in their slogan Be practical, do the impossible. To this demand, the generation that faces the next century can add the more solemn injunction If we don't do the impossible, we shall be faced with the unthinkable. In the Norse legends, Odin, to obtain wisdom, drinks of the magic fountain that nourishes the world tree. In return, the god must forfeit one of his eyes. The symbolism here is clear. Odin must pay a penalty for acquiring the insight that gives him a measure of control over the natural world and breaches its pristine harmony. But his uh, wisdom is that of a one-eyed man. Although he sees the world more accurately, his vision is one-sided. The wisdom of Odin involves a renunciation not only to what Joseph Weber has called the primordial bond with nature, but also of the honesty of perception that accords with nature's early unity. Truth achieves exactness, predictability, and above all, manipulability. It becomes science in the customary sense of the term. But science as we know it today is the fragmented, one-sided vision of a one-eyed god whose vantage point entails domination and antagonism, not co-equality and harmony. In the Norse legends, this uh, wisdom leads to Ragnarok, the downfall of the gods and the destruction of the tribal world. In our day, this one-sided Wisdom is laden with the prospect of nuclear immolation and ecological catastrophe. Humanity has passed through a long history of one-sidedness and of a social condition that has always contained the potential of destruction, despite its creative achievements in technology. 
the great project of our time must be to open the other eye, to see the old side of the holy, to heal and transcend the cleavage between humanity and nature that came with early wisdom. Nor can we deceive ourselves that the reopened eye will be focused on the visions and myths of the primordial peoples, for history has labored over thousands of years to produce entirely new domains of reality that enter into our very humanness. Our capacity for freedom, which includes our capacity for individuality, experience and desire, runs deeper than that of our distant progenitors. We have established a broader material basis for free time, play, security, perception and sensuousness. A material potentially for broader domains of freedom and humanness than humanity in a primordial bond with nature could possibly achieve. But we cannot remove our bonds unless we know them. However unconscious its influence may be, a legacy of domination permeates our thinking. Values, emotions, indeed our very musculature. History dominates us all the more when we are ignorant of it. The historic unconscious must be made conscious. Cutting across the very legacy of domination is another, the legacy of freedom that lives in the daydreams of humanity, in the great ideals and movements, rebellious, anarchic and Dionysian, that have welled up in all great eras of social transition. In our own time, these legacies are intertwined like strands and subvert the clear patterns that existed in the past until the language of freedom becomes interchangeable with that of domination. This confusion has been the tragic fate of modern socialism, a doctrine that has been bled of all its generous ideals. Thus, the past must be dissected in order to exercise it and to acquire a new integrity of vision. We must re-examine the cleavages that separated humanity from nature and the splits within the human community that originally produced this cleavage if the concept of wholeness is to become intelligible and the reopened eye to glimpse a fresh image of freedom. Okay, <laughs> that uh, does it for chapter one. Uh, yeah, quite quite intense, isn't it? <laughs> um, we'll continue very soon with uh, chapter two. Uh, I mean, hopefully next month. Uh, it takes a while to make these and uh, takes the support of these wonderful people who you see on screen right now who support me on Patreon. Uh, consider sending me uh, a contribution monthly there or if one-time payments through coffee or whatever and thank you very much let's continue with the next video hopefully soon thank you very much for making it to the end of the video big hug <laughs>